I'm Ari Schwartz along with Rachel Galligan and Ben Dahl and welcome to the Windsider show where it's all about the W. The semifinals are here. It's best of five. Let's get into it. like our show please consider joining our patreon community for less than a cup of coffee a month you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the w and don't forget to see the amazing staff's written work and content on winsider.com that's winsider.com and for patreon it's patreon.com backslash winsider check us out the WNBA semifinals are here and we're ready for the hot takes the predictions and everything else you come here listening for It's the Minnesota Lynx in Game 1 taking on the Seattle Storm. Just a little background reference. Minnesota Lynx have a record of 14-8, and while the Seattle Storm have a record of 18-4. and The Storm won both games this season against the Minnesota Lynx with a score of 90-60 to and 103-88. to Let's hop right into it. Ben, how's it going? I know you've been crushing it with your daily pods. And you've probably already exhausted these games in your mind and on the air. But we're going to have you on here and, and, and to, to talk a little bit more about it, break it down a little bit more. Initial thoughts, say hi to the folks and, and give me your initial thoughts on this matchup. Yeah, what's going on? Um, I don't think we'll have too much overlap or a problem there. We did did that show with Sabrina to go check Merchant, if you, Sabrina Merchant to go check it out if you haven't. But that was Thursday night. So we were just kind of, we had just kind of found out the matchup. So that was very reactionary. I think you mentioned Minnesota and Seattle. That's an interesting one to think about with both, you know, on both sides with some some notable names kind of wondering what their their status is going to be health-wise and really the well, who are thing, those notable names? Lay it out for the listen. It is a you got Sylvia Fowles who missed a whole bunch of time with that calf strain and then finally returned just in time for the second round game against Phoenix. And they ended up closing the game without her. And we can maybe get into how she looked there. And then Sue Bird and Brianna Stewart missed the last couple games of the regular season for Seattle, which was, I think, largely seen just kind of as a, a more of a cautious measure. But hey, like, I'm sorry, if you're just, <laughs> if you just want to assume Seattle is going to be all systems go from the beginning, you can. I don't know if that's really all that likely to happen. And, the, and then Minnesota Seattle becomes interesting too, because fouls didn't play obviously the second time they met. So really, if you want to even point to something from this matchup, I think it's interesting because you have to go all the way back to basically the very beginning of the season. And then there it also, it is just one game. And then on top of that, you just also wonder, okay, well, Minnesota, especially so much time has passed since then. So are they even really the same team we saw back then? I mean, I don't think they are. We've seen their defense in fluctuation. We've seen their offense step up. They're a completely different team in my book. And 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 I don't even know. If, for, the Minnesota Lynx are an enigma for me because we've seen throughout this season very different teams from one of the best defenses in the league uh, to one of the better three-point shooting teams to neither to both. Like, th- this team is just a very confusing one that's gone back and forth. Rachel, what's your initial reaction when you hear the Minnesota Lynx because for me, someone who's been following the Lynx very closely, if you told me at the beginning of this season or the end of last season that Minnesota Lynx would be entering into a series in the WNBA semifinals, I'd say that's a victory for this team. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think we all can agree that it's been a successful year for Minnesota. Um, really impressed with just how this team has continued to evolve and, and the job that um, Coach Cheryl Reeve has done. And, and you know, I, I there Coach was of the Year, Cheryl Reeve, Rachel. Coach of the Year, Cheryl Reeve. Um, there's just, I think there were so many unknowns, you know, um, I, and I don't know that any of us could have predicted that Crystal Dangerfield was going to do what she did, that even um, Dantas was going to have the type of year that she's had. Uh, the thing that's, you know, for Minnesota to have success in this series, um, there's there's two points I want to make. I they gr- They're going to have to play like they did against Phoenix. Um, and and what, I, what I say with that is it was just a consistent effort across the board. And I'll even take it a step further. <laughs> They're going to have to play like they played against Phoenix, and Fowles can't play like she did. That's not me knocking Fowles. I mean, she has to work some of this rust off, but she's going to have to be 
a dominant force inside. You know, they're going to need that production from her. But, you know, all the all the supporting cast around Dangerfield, Collier, Dante, Sims was Sims was great. She played phenomenal. Bantam's hitting shots. Carlton has been steady. You know, they're going to need that type of effort across the board. Um, and the thing that's the, the most impressive to me about Minnesota is that they've this has just been a team that's they've gotten it done. You know, they've, they've just kind of found a way to get it done. They've been gritty. Has it always been pretty? Absolutely not. Um, I, I, now if you flip the script and we're talking about Seattle, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're looking about at the two matchups early in the season. Ben already talked about how Fowles wasn't in, in, in one of those matchups, but winning of a margin of, you know, 20 points, that's, that's a lot. And that, it's, a, it's a similar scenario when we talk about the other matchup of aces and sun, but um, you know, I, I think it's the health, you know, can the Seattle storm team stay healthy through a five game series? Um, yeah, we know how dominant they are, uh, but are they going to be able to click on all cylinders for an entire, you know, at least three games? I'm not sure. I do think there are some question marks with that. There's no doubt that Seattle is the better team. Um, but this, this Minnesota team is dangerous, you know, especially with the way they're playing right now. Well, that's the interesting aspect of it, which is the way they're playing now versus this is the playoffs. It's not a do or die. Um, and, and to your point that you were talking about, I know Ben wants to talk about this, like still scoring. If, if you look back at that Mercury game, obviously there's rust to shake off and obviously, you know, we can't say, well, if so-and-so would have hit this, well, yeah, if Skylar Diggins Smith didn't lay an egg, then it, you know, Minnesota probably doesn't win and Mercury are, are in this, in, in a series, uh, cause obviously they, they re, they recede, but for me, I mean, that game isn't even close if Sylvia Fowles makes a couple of those bunnies. If Sylvia, like, Sylvia Fowles looked more similar to the Sylvia Fowles we saw last year, where she was dropping easy rebounds, where she was missing bunnies. Um, she just wasn't there fully. And obviously, a lot of that has to do with the rust coming back, you know, conditioning, getting ready, and, you know, flowing with the team. They found a way to win, so that's where we are now. But if Sylvia Fowles, if this team wants to win, like you were saying, Rachel, Sylvia Fowles needs to step up. Ben, when when we talk about this game, you know, what's it going to take for Minnesota to beat the dominant Seattle Storm? Yeah, I mean, on Fowles, which you just mentioned, yeah, if Sylvia is just finishing her chances around the basket to to take that point and move forward with it, Seattle's going to have a huge problem trying to guard Sylvia, right? They don't have a good matchup for her. Yeah, Mercedes Russell's a little bigger, has some size. She can't guard Sylvia one-on-one. And then, so with Seattle's starting lineup, they got to send help. That's a pretty big problem for them. It's going to be a pretty big, you know, one specific thing for Demiris Dantes is it's going to be really a, an important series and kind of an instructive series for her because they rely on her so much as kind of a passing hub. And a lot of, a lot of the, t- the things they are able to do, throwing it inside to Sill, they rely on Dantes to make those passes a lot. So can you make them with the length of Brianna Stewart? or I may possibly Natasha Howard, or then probably Ezzy Magbagor even, who has plenty of length too. Can she make those passes without telegraphing them too much, without putting too much air underneath them? Because, you know, the, the, the big thing for Minnesota, whether if they're playing inside through fouls or through Collier, especially this time of year where you, we've got four of the five best defenses in the league left standing, you know, they just, they just can't, they just can't wait too long for a beat. They can't, they, again, they can't show their hand telegraphing those passes. They can't stand there and stare at the player too long before they throw it. And they have to be able to flow into the next thing. You know, they have to they have to keep the engine moving and really put together complete offensive games if if they want to have a chance. A thousand percent. I mean, the, for me, it's it's it builds off that. It's can you get the pass? Can you if you're going to be playing in and out, can you get the pass in and feed it out when that help comes to guard sill? And then we talk about. Can they hit shots? Will uh, Lexi Brown be back in the lineup where she's one of the most dynamic three-point shooters on this team? They're going to need her, and they're going to need, this is going to sound ridiculous, but post-concussion Lexi Brown. And I mean that in the sense of when she had her concussion earlier in the season, she came back to drop 25 the following game. They're going to need that from her because she's been hit or miss. She's been hot or cold this whole season. And Crystal Dangerfield, we saw a very timid, unfamiliar Crystal Dangerfield in the first half of that Phoenix Mercury game, she was not pulling up the shots from super deep. Like she's the type of player who's going to pull up a half court shot and not blink about it. And we need to see that if, if Minnesota wants to be able to pull off a victory, she needs to get to the paint 
it, it's going to be an interesting matchup. The matchup of her and Jordan Canada is something that I'm very, very excited for. In general, I'm I'm excited for this matchup because I think if the Lynx are playing at their best, they can compete with Seattle. And the question, and that's against Seattle at you know normal Seattle, whatever. But we've seen points where Seattle's kind of dipped and not been the dominant team that we we expect them and have seen them to be. What's going to be the key for Seattle, Rachel, to pull off a victory against Minnesota? I think rebounding is a big one in this series. Both teams, you know, they've, they've been close matchups um, and being able to control the glass. I mean, I'm going to say this for both. It's, uh, it's honestly probably even bigger for uh, the, the next matchup, um, to be honest with you. But, I mean, that's going to be an absolute bloodbath. But this one, I mean, Seattle, they got to stay healthy. You know, they're, they're going to have to be healthy. Um, that They're, they're going to be – they could start out a little slow. You know, sometimes you see these double buy situations and, um, you know, it's a little, it's almost like it's a little bit too much rest, you know, um, but they'll be fine. You know, I do think there's a lot of question marks um, surrounding, you know, how, how Sue Bird going to do in this series, um, those types of things. And I'm sure Stewart's going to be ready to go, but, you know, like across the board, the, the, the depth and the versatility and the offensive versatility of this team is, is so good um, that I really don't see it. <laughs> highly unlikely that Minnesota can can get past Seattle. Um, Seattle's just that, that dominant. So being able to stay consistent, being able to stay healthy, um, and just that versatile scoring. You know, Jewel Lloyd has to be good. Um, she can't disappear. Um, and I do think, you know, the matchup of Jordan Canada, like you said, and, and Dangerfield, very, two, two different types of players, but both two very dynamic and explosive point guards that um, can create a lot of opportunities on the floor, whether it's for themselves or for their teammates. Uh, but Seattle, I mean, just has to be Seattle. Yeah, they got they got to keep fighting through and, and be there who they are. Not to to rush through this. So Ben, I'll give you a chance to to give a little bit more thoughts. But I want to kind of go through it for all three of us about and naming two players on each team. No copping out. Two players on each team that are going to be the key to victory. Now, me personally, I typically like to move away from the stars. So. For me, for Seattle, it's going to be Natasha Howard and Jewel Lloyd. I've been saying this all season long, and I will reiterate it today. Natasha Howard is going to be the key for this team to win a championship. We know what a healthy Brianna Stewart can do. We know what a healthy Sue Bird can do and the importance of having both those players on the roster and playing healthy basketball. But for me, it's been the question of Natasha Howard all season long. To your point, Rachel, rebounding to a defensive point, to many aspects of it. Natasha Howard is such a key element of this team. And she, the addition of Natasha, a healthy and Natasha Howard playing at her best is the type of player who turns this team from a good team to a great team, in my opinion. And then Jewel Lloyd, who missed most of last year. And a lot of people like to ignore that and forget about the fact that Sue Bird, Brianna Stewart, and Jewel Lloyd were all injured all of last year. Jewel Lloyd, not for like the complete year, but you get what I'm saying. Jewel Lloyd's been on a tear this season. So for me, she's the key player for Seattle. Uh, you know, obviously Minnesota is going to try to hone in as best they can on Sue Bird, on Natasha Howard and Brianna Stewart. And that's where Jewel Lloyd comes in and she's going to need to step up. And then for Minnesota, maybe I'm I'm copping out by saying Sylvia Fowles. But the question mark, of, like I, I think very clearly, I'll say this on air, Minnesota gets swept if Sylvia Fowles isn't playing. And if Sylvia Fowles isn't playing at her best, Minnesota is probably going to get swept anyways. Uh, so the question is truly, can Sylvia Fowles come and show up? And then Crystal Dangerfield, she's been the one who orchestrates this offense. She's been the one who saves this team when they've gotten in ruts. And it was kind of similar to what I said last season uh, with, I'm blanking on her name out, with Nafisa Collier and Jessica Shepard. There we go. Um, those players came into it with this pedigree of winning. And that's what I've seen from Crystal Dangerfield all season. She came from a winning pedigree college. I'm not going to say where she went to school because you already know. But then she came to Minnesota, a team that's been struggling, has really instilled that winning pedigree to this team. So I'm going to flip it over to Ben. Give me your key players, then any final thoughts you have on this matchup before we get into predictions. Yeah, I don't know if I really have a... Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's really like a a profound thing to say for like a Seattle player. I think you touched on a lot there. Jewel Lloyd, by the way, like I, again, I just, I think we kind of overdo it to push back on what you said a little bit. Like even like this year, she had that amazing game against Indiana, which they lost. And then the next two, when they lose to Vegas, one for 11 next game against Indiana, one for seven. It's just 
you know, Jewel Lloyd isn't the same player game to game still. And the last time they were deep in the playoffs, she got benched for Sammy Whitcomb and they didn't drop off. So it's just. <laughs> yeah, there are uh, consistency question marks there that are valid for sure. Yeah. And Natasha, Natasha didn't play more than 20 minutes in a game until the middle of the season. And it was that game against Connecticut. And then I believe it was Gary Kloppenberg even said like, yeah, we saw a little bit of that defensive player of the year kind of impact she can have. She played 22 minutes in the game. And if you're going to do this, I, I would also just kind of, this isn't a player, but I wanted, I didn't butt in earlier. Just like, when was the last time Seattle actually was dominant? Like this word keeps getting thrown around. Like which game in this regular season can you point to? Is it the ones where they're very blowing, early in the season? <laughs> is it the ones where they're blowing out the lottery teams? Because, like, if you really want to point to, like, Bird has to be on the floor for them to be at their best. And, you know, they beat L.A. by one early in the month, and they did beat Minnesota by double digits, but Fowles didn't, wasn't in that game. So if, if you want to point back to that stretch of blowouts, okay, they beat Kennedy, the Dream Without Kennedy Carter. They beat the Wings. They did beat the Sun pretty comfortably, and then they both blew up Liberty. But, so it just... But looking at this matchup, like, it's a 20-point margin. Granted, there, there's a, it's such a fluid situation on both sides. Question marks with Fowles, question marks with Sue Bird. Like, that's what kind of makes this so interesting. Like, who's going to be on the floor? Who's going to be playing at their best? Who's not? But, yeah, I mean, just looking at the scores, given whoever has been on the court or not, like, they've they've won by, like, 20 points. Average of twenty points. I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, to Ben's point, yeah, the the teams that they like handled mightily uh, were not exactly the best teams. They did blow Sun out, the Connecticut out. They did blow the Sky out at one point. Obviously, Wings and Liberty and Fever aren't you know mind blowing games, so I'm not going to give them props for that. But you're right. You're right. I'll give you. I'll give you that. I, I me personally, I've been on the Jewel Lloyd hype train for a while, but consistency is definitely the question. Are we going to see a, a series from her? Or are we going to see a situation where she shows up for a little bit and then they have to put in Sammy Wickham for the rest of the time? Um, that being said, like, look, well, I, I, you know where I'm at. But, uh, Rachel, give me your thoughts. Who are the key players? <laughs> um, key players? I mean, for, for Seattle, I mean, Alicia Clark's been consistent and steady all year long. She's always going to be a key factor. Obviously, Brianna Stewart, not telling you anything you don't know. Um, you know, she's she's – she's going to, she could have a chip on her shoulder. You know, I'm, I'm curious to see how Stewart's going to come out um, following the MVP nod or, you know, you know, you never, you just never know um, if you use that for some type of fuel or whatever that may be. Question marks is, you know, how much is Bird going to be on the floor? Um, I, I think that's fair um, to, to question what's going to happen at this point with her. Um, I do think that like we need to see a little bit of consistency from Lloyd. Um, I don't know that she's an X factor by any stretch. Um, but now flip it over to Minnesota. I mean, Nafisa Collier has to get a few more touches, in my opinion. Um, get her going early is going to be important. Danger field. You know, I'm, I'm really impressed with how she came out and responded that second half as a rookie in a, a playoff game, high stakes game, um, and, and made things happen. I think she's going to be good, um, which is really a, a credit to her and her mentality at, at this stage of her career. Um, Dantas has to be good. You know, she, she really – it's not just one or two people to me. It's just how many people can they get to play consistent. Odyssey Sims was really, really good. If Sims can do what she did against Phoenix in this series, they've got a chance, in my opinion. I was going to say Sims is, Sims is a huge key. Yeah. If, huge. If Sims can elevate, you know, and, and just be really good and, and, like, have a great series, they've got a chance to maybe steal one or two. Well, and then to me, that's the crazy part, honestly, is actually I'll flip this over to you, Ben, uh, before we get to our predictions, which and this is such a tricky question, but I'm going to ask it. Which do you think is going to be more important for Minnesota to take advantage of or to try and focus in on the guard play or the front court play? Like, which one of them do you think Minnesota can say, like, all right, the other one? Obviously, look, we need to play best on both ends, but like one of them you can almost say, let's focus in and we feel this is somewhere we can take an advantage. And if done right, we can pull off some wins. So I guess you're really asking for like, what's the bigger strength of theirs? Uh, strength? Well, no, because I think it, like you have to adjust it to it. But I guess, where do you think uh, Minnesota has a feeling that they can kind of take advantage against Seattle? Well, it has to be their front court. Again, it's just Seattle can't guard Sylvia Fowles. If she's healthy, she's going to post up hard and they're going to find her. 
you know, actually see her when she's open and be able to make those passes. That was really a big theme of their season last last year. And now that they have more shooting, in theory, it should be easy. Obviously, they didn't have the runway in the regular season to have, <laughs> have actually been able to do that all, all season with fouls being out. And to Rachel's point, I think I would add for Nafisa Collier, I do think they need to lean on a little bit more of a perimeter-oriented Collier. I think that's kind of sometimes the thing that gets lost. You know she can cut, she can duck in, you can post her up a little bit, especially if Fowles is in the game and she's at the three and she's just taller than Alicia Clark. But I think they need some of that perimeter stuff mixed in too because it's just, it's just going to be hard. Seattle's defense is really good. And, you know, like early in that first game, you know, they just ran a Collier fouls give and go. You know, like give her a little dribble pitch, get her a handoff, and give her a chance to attack. I think they're going to have to try to be intentional to give Collier more of those touches because even if she has some good games out of the post, there's still it's just going to be really hard. Seattle's really good about flying out and rotating and closing out to shooters. I would say that's the other thing really coming from the front court and the attention that they draw. You know, Minnesota, they have plenty of good shooters on this roster, but to make them in the playoffs, I think we had a couple, they had a couple of those shots that you kind of circle. Rachel Bannum had one of them that got tweeted out where it's like, you catch it and you can maybe freeze it and say like, yeah, you're open. But then you see that defender flying in and it really isn't all that open of a shot. But those are the shots you have to hit. Bridget Carlton, Demir Stantis, Crystal Dangerfield, Lexi Brown, if she's out of protocol and back in the rotation, Kiki Herbert Harrigan, if she's in there, Bantam, like I just rattled off. Like that's a pretty, that's a pretty deep list of capable shooters, relatively speaking. And, and they can generate those shots, but also just making them, you know, being able to make them, that's you know, that can really that, it's it can be that simple sometimes. That make or break the WNBA playoffs. That's how you do it. All right, we're into predictions. We're moving on to game two of the semifinals. I'll go first, and this is going to be a hot take, which I expect neither of you to agree with me on, but I'm going to do it. I'm rolling the dice. I'm putting money down. Go big or go home. Minnesota Lynx take game one and then are swept the rest of the games, so they end up losing in game four, three to one. So prediction for game one and then prediction for the series. Ben, you're up next. Let's see. For game one... Game one, I think I think I might go Minnesota too. I'm gonna go Seattle in five though. I think Minnesota Ooh. will will get another one at some point. Pricing in just if Fowles is healthy and at least playing, even if it's a little more limited amount of time, and even if Bird's at full strength, I'm in, I'm anticipating they're not gonna they're not gonna really push that too hard, especially early in the series. Maybe getting her up to 30, 32 minutes. So that clearly affects how you can guard them. So not even, not even, not really questioning what Stewart's going to be able to give them. I'm not too worried about that, but I think Minnesota just having, even if it's 20 good minutes of fouls, I think that can, that can give them a chance to win, to win at least two here. Rachel. I think Seattle will take the first one. Um, won't be a blowout. I'm going to say Seattle by about eight to 10. Uh, we'll, we'll go eight. Um, and Seattle in four. Seattle wins what? Seattle wins in four. Oh, all right. Moving on. Don't forget to hit subscribe on Winsider Daily on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget to read the written content on Winsider.com. That's Winsider.com. And the Winsider Network, a collection of WNBA podcasts. Hit subscribe to all of them. And don't forget Patreon.com backslash Winsider. Next series, number one Las Vegas Aces versus the Connecticut Sun. The Sun are 10 and 12 on the season, while the Aces are tied with Seattle Storm at 18 and 4. Aces won both games so far this season, 93-78 and 99-78. The real question, guys, will Connecticut score more than 78 points in this playoff series? No, I'm joking. Uh, but let's move on. I'm curious, Ben, what's going to be the key for Seattle, sorry, for Connecticut to win against the Las Vegas Aces? They have to score in the half court. I mean, that's. Uh, I think it's. I think it's. We don't have to fret too hard, kind of worrying about that one. Connecticut was, I believe, I just had this in a piece the other day. They were the tenth best half court offense in terms of efficiency, points per possession this season. And yeah, they're really good in transition with Alyssa Thomas running. 
but Vegas is pretty good with their transition defense. They don't go, they don't go all out all that very often, going for offensive rebounds. So I don't think it's gonna Vegas will need much of an adjustment to to hammer home like, hey, we got to get back because we're against AT in this series. So you know, AT on our AT on our own can still get you some stuff there, but they're gonna have to prove it in the half court and. What are you going to really turn to? You know, ultimately, I think Jasmine Thomas does need to have an efficient series. She needs to make good decisions on, you know, getting them into offense quickly. I think would would be the most important thing, because, you know, I think that's where the aces really shine. Is they're so good getting into action right away, and they're going to go through multiple things. If you're going to take too long and you can only get through one thing, then you're really going to get stuck in the mud against the aces. I think they're just too good on defense. And then she, Jasmine just needs to make good decisions. They need her to, you know, step in her pull-up jumper with confidence when it's there, just to give them an option. They need her finishing at the rim when she can get there, even though they don't have as much space to give her those driving lanes with this year's team. And then Dewana Bonner just has to be efficient. She can't fall too in love with contested jump shots. And and again, I think it really comes back to they just they really have to squeeze every single thing they can out of a possession because just coming down running one option, it's just not going to be nearly enough. Yeah. I mean, for me, how how are the Sun going to win it? It's staying in front of Alyssa Thomas. We know Bonner is going to eat to a degree. Alyssa Thomas is going to get hers, but you have to try and contain her to a degree. But for me, like the key, the key, the key is what are we going to see from the other players? Can Jones get it going? Can January? Last year going into the playoffs for Connecticut, it was all about the three J's. Jonquil Jones and Jasmine. And this year... It's about Jones, Jasmine, and January. It's gonna be it's gonna be really telling to see what offensively can we see from Jasmine Thomas. We know she's gonna be great defensively for the most part. We know January can lock down defensively, but what are we gonna see in the half court game between them offensively? Offense has been the key and the question mark for me on this team all season long, just because it's been so reliant on two players, and you need to get some backcourt help when it comes to this. And then let's flip it over to the Aces. You know, the playbook for me to beat the Las Vegas Aces is kind of contain Asia Wilson, but don't forget about Angel. That's a little bit simplistic, but I think you hear where I'm coming from. Rachel, I'm curious your thoughts on the series. Uh, What's it going to take for each team to beat each other? You know, it's it's just I feel like this is a hell of a matchup just from a, a the toughness category standpoint. Now, what are the toughness categories? In my mind, those are rebounding, getting to the free throw line. Um, creating second chance opportunities, you know, on the offensive glass. And, and it's, it's weird. Like when you dive into the, the, the previous two meetings between these two teams, and it's hard to compare, you know, this Connecticut team to what they were, but um, you know, the, Connecticut has to get to the free throw line. You know, they have to be the aggressor offensively in terms of keeping the aces on their heels um, really, you know, looking to attack the rim, take attack out, you know, drop, penetrate, kick, um, create opportunities from their perimeter, and they have to make shots. I mean, you, you look at you look at some of these matchups from the past, these these box scores. Like it, one game, Connecticut shot twenty nine free throws. You know, like like so that was the emphasis of this game is hey, we're gonna we're gonna win this free throw battle. A lot of that lies on the shoulders of Duana Bonner, who gets there, you know, consistently, um, and then Alyssa Thomas doing the job that she does, but. It, you know, from a rebounding standpoint, but you know, you're right. There, there has to be um, a more concert, concerted effort offensively. Who's going to step up? Who's going to be able to knock down shots? You can't go four for nineteen from the three point line. You know, you can't shoot twenty one percent and forty one percent on the game. There's just no way. You players have to make shots. Brand January has to has to knock down open shots. Um, and it, for me to to kind of echo off what Ben was saying, Jasmine Thomas is the X, X factor. Um, of this Connecticut Sun team you know I, yeah Dewana Bonner's played great um, we're talking about AT and the job she's done she's a force she's the engine that makes this team go but they need um, they need other people to elevate their their level of play um, to, to combat the depth of this Aces team which is just terrifying in my opinion oh I completely agree with you it's like they are a scary team key players for me on the Aces side I'm curious your guys' thought on this, so I'll flip it to Ben after me, but Kayla McBride, who's been stepping it up. Actually, real quickly, I just want to say the the thing uh, I thought about this when Rachel started talking, the thing that kind of intrigues me the most about this matchup is I feel like the Aces 
best games have been later in the season. And we can talk about consistency or whatever. I feel like the Aces have been better later in the season. Similarly to Connecticut, we talk a lot during regular seasons about kind of hitting your peak too early. You know, whatever you want, whatever phrase you want to use, playing your best basketball at the right time is so important. And Connecticut by far is playing their best basketball at the right time. That's why this team is a lot better than the sub 500 record we're seeing from them. Uh, but like I was saying, Kayla McBride, who's been playing much better of recent, she was honestly, excuse my language, just horrible in the beginning of the season. And then as much as this pains me, if you've listened to the show or if you've been following me or Winsider for years now, I think another key player is going to be D-Rob. You know, what's she going to bring? She's been really, really good this season. She's hit historic numbers in many categories. As much as it pains me to say it, she's going to be an X factor for Las Vegas in this series. Uh, because they're going to need to to get some rotations going in their front in their backcourt, excuse me. So I'm curious, Ben, who are the key players for you? I touched on Jasmine Thomas already. I think that's the the big one for Connecticut, and I think their best bench player at this point is a rookie, and Kyla Charles. Charles has been really solid, but this is going to be, you know, a new level very early in her career to have to deliver for them. And I don't know if they have an easy switch to flip to just get more shooting on the floor. You know, I think they might lose a little too much defensively if Letitia Heideman or then even Kalina Mosqueda Lewis are going to be in the rotation. So maybe you point to Essence Carson too. For Vegas, I, I don't know. I kind of believe all their, I think all their six best players are going to show up, including Robinson as the sixth one there. I think really the X factor is kind of the, are these two coaches going to kind of just, is someone going to make a move here or, are, you know, is someone going to blink or are they just going to kind of keep stay par for the course with their rotation with Carolyn Swords and Brianna Jones? You can kind of say, well, they match, they match, kind of match each other. Right. Whereas if Vegas goes all in on playing their best five and it's Dierka Hamby and Asia Wilson together even more than we've seen in a lot of regular season games. Cause if it gets to that point, I think Connecticut really just has to, I think they might just need to go all in and go in smaller too. Are they, are they going to do what you've been praying that Kurt Miller will do? Yeah. I, are they? I don't know. I think if Vegas is going to play their best group and they're going to play Hamby and Wilson, I think, I think Connecticut, I think Connecticut has to, that they have to do it to be able to score. And, and background on what Ben's talking about is Alyssa Thomas at the five. Rachel, I'm curious your thoughts, putting Alyssa Thomas at the five, playing that style of basketball, you know, Kurt Miller, you know, the Connecticut son. What are your thoughts? And and I should say you're a Hall of Fame front court player. <laughs> Whatever. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, I think you got to throw the kitchen th- kitchen sink at the Aces at this point. You know, it's it's they're they're that good. They have that many weapons, that many tools. <laughs> um, At why not? I mean, she's the, in, my, in my opinion um, the toughest player in the league in terms of just physicality and 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 willpower, um, especially you know around the basket. So. Why not? Um, I love it. I think you have to get really strategic. You got to muck it up. You got to keep Las Vegas out of their rhythm, one way, shape, or form. Um, now you can't necessarily. Asia Wilson's going to get hers. You know, you can't let her go off for for thirty five. Um, but that that's who they're going to run their offense for. So so you know you you can try to just keep that under control. Um, but but really, I think for me, getting to the key player point, like to me, it comes down to Kayla McBride, of course. If she's playing the way she's played the last few games, then everyone's in trouble. This is a sweep. Um, and and I, would, I would actually echo Jackie Young, too, who we haven't talked about enough this year and the job she's done. And she's really evolved into the player that a lot of us who watched her through college um, saw that she was. Um, she's, she doesn't get a lot of praise because of this roster, and, but she's been really steady. Those two, if they're clicking on all cylinders, are, are the difference maker. Kayla McBride has to knock down shots. We all know that, you know, Dear Hamby's going to bring what she brings. Um, you know, and honestly, <laughs> Carolyn Swords has been really good, too. Um, and just her role and what she's done. It's, that, that's the thing that I love with this Aces team is they all know their role. And they all know how to play it so well. Probably beyond any other team in this league, in my opinion. Um, sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. But I, I do think that... Um, yeah, I do think that Kayla McBride is a huge difference maker, probably followed by Jackie Young in terms of, um, how they can compete in this series. But if you're Connecticut, 
you got to throw the kitchen sink at them. You got to you got to keep them out of their rhythm. You got to throw some new looks at it. You got to switch some things up. You got to do whatever you can. I want to jump talk. in on yeah. On, go for uh, it. Then I have a question for you. Yeah, I want to jump in on swords. Who yeah has been good in her role, and and I think to the lineup question for Connecticut too. You know they were number two in offensive rebounding percentage, like two tenths behind Minnesota, number one. Vegas was the number one defensive rebounding team this season. So if you're Connecticut, I, maybe you can say, hey, we're still going to, we can still, we still think we can do a lot of damage there. I don't know if that's really going to happen against the Aces. So that also kind of led me to that point of bringing it up. You know, if, if you don't have Jones in there to really dominate on the offensive glass, have, a, have, have, games, losses. have games where she's getting five or six of them. You know, can she post up a little bit and score? Maybe, but then every, you know, all those other possessions, you know, she isn't a threat. She isn't out of the three point line. So just change the, you know, change the geometry of the floor with what you have out there. And that, I, I, I just think, it, I think it's really fascinating. I think it's a fun thing to nerd out on. And if we can actually see it, I think it could, you know, I think it could work out pretty well for them. It moves, it might move Bonner out of the matchup with Angel McCaudry, which is a pretty incredible matchup at small forward. Superstar matchup. Yeah, especially, you know, with Angel has what I think Michelle Vopel brought it up, what Angel hasn't been in the playoffs in four years, which is really, which is wild to say that out loud. And then Bonner now is the number one banana here for Connecticut. And Bonner might be uniquely equipped to guard Angel because she's at least really long and might be able to bother Angel in ways that pretty much every other small forward in the league right now can't really even have a chance. But you know, they have Breon January, who I think it might be one of the two or three best players to throw on Kayla McBride. And even if you have to throw Charles or Carson on McCautry, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world to just give your offense a little bit of a better chance to make thing make things hard on the Aces. The Aces have one of the best defenses in the league, if not the best defense in the league. So I'm curious, Ben, for you, what it, I don't want to say the Achilles, but what is something that Connecticut can kind of take advantage of and then if you can just expand, well, I guess, no, just my thoughts on the Dwana Bonner covering Asia Wilson, that's a key element too. But I also, I get weary of what we talk about all the time, which is Asia's shooting style. Will Bonner play smart basketball, play between the ears and say, I'm not going to foul her and get in foul trouble, knowing the effect that that's going to have on both sides of the ball for my team in this series. I think that's a key element also. Um, but yeah, talk to me about kind of not the Achilles, because I don't know if they necessarily have one, but what's something that Connecticut can look to take advantage of offensively against this stout Aces defense? I, I don't think there's really a ton. I mean, I, they don't have they don't have enough overall just really good knockdown shooters, right? I mean, who's the best shooter in their starting lineup? Probably you have to say Breon January, the best three-point shooter, I should say. Okay. And then after that. You know, I think you're looking at, you know, Jasmine Thomas in and around kind of being an average three-point shooter, you know, for the most part, wants to just take the really open ones. Dewana Bonner, you know, for her career has been well below the league average as a three-point shooter. People still guard her out there. And this year she's been even below 30%. So you can still say she's going to get hot out there. But, you know, I think you can get open threes against the aces where I can, I guess that's, the closest thing I can come to of saying something you really want to poke at, although I don't think Connecticut has an ideal kind of way to do that. But again, I just think, I think it's going small. It has to be that because then you can just run a bunch of Dewana Bonner, Alyssa Thomas pick and roll and Bonner can look to get to all the way to the rim and have an easier time of doing that when you also don't have a center standing there in the lane. And then you can actually get AT rolling to the basket with a little bit of space, right? And that's what which, what she's been so good at in recent seasons with John Quill Jones spacing out. And they can kind of replicate that a little bit with this. If you have three guards on the perimeter around that, I think that can... Now Vegas might would probably end up just switching that. But you can still just put those two players in positions to actually work with some space in the lane. I think that's really, that's really like the two things, the two levers for them to try to pull on. I hear you. Rachel, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with Ben. And just to echo it a little bit more and probably, I guess, probably repeat myself a little bit. Like it, I think that Connecticut, um, this is a, this is a toughness matchup in my mind. We talked about toughness points, toughness categories, both teams at times can 
kind of play that bully ball a little bit, you know, um, and that's what's going to make this so good. And in my mind, combined with the disrespect narrative that, you know, is being pushed right now in the Connecticut locker room, you got to do what you got to do, you know, and playoff Connecticut that's pissed off with a chip on their shoulder. That's only going to fuel them in terms of those toughness points and that those toughness categories. Like Ben said, they don't have enough shooters that are going to knock down shots consistently going small points in the paint, attacking the rim, getting to the free throw line, you know, controlling the glass, which is going to be extremely hard to do against Las Vegas. That, but that's a huge stat. Um, and being able to create second, third chance opportunities with AT, it, it's going to have to be mucked up. It's going to have to be ugly. It's going to have to be an all-out brawl. But this Connecticut team can do that because, especially of the way Alyssa Thomas is playing right now, you know, she sets the tone with that. And if they can set that early and be that aggressor, which I do think they are capable of, um, that is one area where they could have a leg up um, on, on Las Vegas, at least in a game or two, in my opinion. All right, let's talk predictions. I'll go first because I, I, in the show notes, I put myself last, but I realize it's not fair. Uh, so I'll go first. I see Vegas pulling off game one victory, but I think this does go to five and Vegas pulls off the victory going to the WNBA finals in game five behind a Derek Hamby layup. Rachel. What are your thoughts? It's really hard because it's like part of me still has this hangover from Vegas from last year where it was like, I know it's a completely different team, um, but and we knew how good they could be, um, but yet there were still some inconsistencies. Like I've been just kind of waiting. Like when is Las Vegas going to just like really kind of hit that struggle bus? <laughs> and they really haven't. I mean, they've, they've been phenomenal this entire year and, and uh, it's going to be so hard. To, to for Connecticut to, to advance to the finals. There's no doubt about it. Hot that. take it, Rachel. Rachel, hot take it. Hot take it what? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I just, I guess I have this like lingering weird feeling that like what happens if LA just like, or not LA, Las Vegas just comes out and just kind of isn't their, their selves, you know, like, like which would go against everything we've seen this entire year. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know where that's coming from. It's just a weird feeling. Like I just, I, it's like I don't fully trust the consistency of this team all year that they've shown us all year. I want to. I know that they can go win this entire WNBA playoffs. They have to stay healthy. You know, um, I just I just kind of I'm concerned about this matchup, and I, I do think it can go to five. I think Vegas will end up winning the first one. Um, yeah, I'll go, I'll go Vegas. I think it'll be close. Vegas by five. Um, Vegas will win in five. Vegas by five, Vegas wins in five. Ben Dahl, what are your thoughts? Oh, Rachel, I think you're just, you're wondering if the other shoe's going to drop, right? I think that's totally, yeah, like, it's like a I thing we, like, what, what, you know, like you just get this weird feeling like it could happen, you know? Well, and it happens every year with a team that come that rises. If there's a team that maybe outperforms what you or, or a bunch of people expect, I think that's totally normal. In 2018, I wasn't a believer in the storm going into the playoffs and <laughs> turned out I was wrong. And I guess, I guess people might say I'm, I'm hating on the storm again this year too, but Hey, I, that, that was me on DC last year. So, Hey, for me, I'm, I'm taking aces game one. I think the aces win this in four. I'll give Connecticut a game. Maybe they shoot it really well defensively overall, like their defense is real. And I think there are a lot of ways we'll see that borne out. I think they match up well on the perimeter with these, with these multiple options for the aces. I think they have options at least on Angel McCautry. I think they have multiple options that are better than, you know, any one that some of these other teams have where, you know, Angel just, you know, can run people run people completely over or just post them up and it's like they're not even there. And they have multiple players they can throw at Kayla McBride. I think they can do a pretty good job on Jackie Young to at least at least keep her out of the lane. I think you still you're going to kind of be at Jackie's mercy if she's making all these pull-up jumpers and at the end of the day though they also they don't have an answer for asia wilson they aren't going to be able to i don't i don't think make life actually all that difficult on her we've seen this story before as good as Alyssa thomas is you know she isn't very long she isn't very tall asia can shoot right over her and if they put somebody else asia's probably gonna be able to drive right around them bonner a, a potential matchup rea alluded to if they end up throwing the different lineup out there. Bonner has some length, but she's also much smaller than Asia. So, that, I mean, they just don't have an answer for her. So even if they do a good job on these other options for the Aces, which I think 
might be kind of the way that that plays out if things if the aces maybe don't look like you know the number two offense in the league and just completely dominate the way they did some of these other games but at the end of the day i do think they still have they still have asia to carry them home well i'm going to wrap it up by saying that i think it would be ridiculous and crazy and amazing if any of these teams besides seattle won the championship this year just looking if you look like last year at where Connecticut was and what was expected of them to then lose John Quell and the players that they lost, Courtney and Strick, and then win the championship would be insane. For Vegas, it's a little bit different, but still to lose Liz and lose Plum and then still pull off this victory would be pretty crazy. Seattle, eh. Minnesota, what they've gone through, not really having the Maya Moores, the Simone Augustuses, the Rebecca Brunsons, and like what we've historically known as this team to pull off a, a finals victory would be pretty insane. So, hey, we're we're suit we're strapping in for an amazing end to the WNBA season. And for less than a cup of coffee a month, you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the W. Tune in during the series is series is, is while we break down what happened, what's going to happen, and have some exciting and cool guests come on to help us break these things down. We'll be back. <laughs>